Okay, so yeah, so we'll get started then. So I'd like to invite Paul to, I thought it'd be useful first if we give Paul a chance to give us a sort of overview of the book and some kind of discussion of the context um, of the study. So in case some of you haven't had a chance to um, dip into it yet. So over to you, Paul. Thanks, Emily. And thanks, James and the group for hosting this. I'm very grateful. Um, this book was really my difficult second album. I mean, when people advise you on monograph writing to set targets, I fully endorse that now, maybe after the event. But um, my PhD was on websites. Uh, and again, websites in the 2004, 2005 periods. And um, by and large, my conclusion from that, looking at how websites were used to frame the conflict in Northern Ireland was that they were postcards, you know, effectively islands of political communication, but they weren't being used in any engaging way. And in a second book that was contracted with Manchester University Press, um, I mean, the proposal was very much expecting a continuation of that with social media, um, mainly because the interviewees, um, which do feature in this uh, book in chapter one, had from the political parties in the DUP, from Sinn Féin, had all suggested that there's an Obama effect on this. We may use it for some campaigning, but it will not radically shift relations, whether it's between political parties, communities, NGOs, and other groups. And there was very much a, a negative perspective on that. And then while doing the book, the flag protests happen. So again, for some context, for those of you who might not be familiar with it, this is uh, you know December, 2012, there's a, a decision by Belfast City Council to change their protocol on the flying of the Union flag over Belfast City Hall. It had previously flown all year round and, it, and the proposal which is passed in the council is to reduce this to 18 designated days in line with the rest of Great Britain, it should be said. And we have Facebook and, and Twitter and YouTube being used um, for the first time, I argue in the book, to um, articulate um, on the half of the protesters their opposition to this decision, to organize mass demonstrations, also to provide what they think are visual evidence videos on YouTube of um, police brutality against the protesters. And in response, as the title suggests, we have critics of the protests. We have people who um, firmly reject the basis on, of, on which they are protesting, the disruption caused by these street demonstrations between December 2012 and March 2013, who turned to Twitter um, and turned to Twitter in ways which can be quite irreverent. There's a lot of use of memes, of wordplay, a hashtag called flags. Um, I hope my accent, while deteriorating somewhat since living in England, can convey that. It's sort of a, a East Belfast way of saying flag. And we have people using social media in a way where they're connected by emotional response again, affective publics, as Papa Cherizi calls them, where they're mobilizing against this. And we almost have these you know, pro and anti flag protest movements playing out on social media uh, with increasingly um, significant effects in terms of even the media coverage. You know, there's one incident where allegations of and rumors about um, the Garda and Shikona, the police in the Republic of Ireland being used to um, police the flag protests, completely untrue. But the justice minister has to respond to what is effectively a rumor which is spread on Facebook and Twitter. And the other major case study in the book, uh, so I, I, it really collects empirical data from December 2012 through to 2016, um, is the Ardoin Parade dispute, where we have a few years later similar themes. So I looked at, again, Twitter, and in particular how people were discussing this contentious parade in North Belfast. And you have a similar issue there, but perhaps more evidence of misinformation and very bad photoshopping or disinformation where people are trying to inflame tensions around this march. And what both sort of suggest to me again is that there is definitely a context that we need to consider when we look at the impact of digital activism, but also how effective publics mobilized during contentious parades react to it that certainly when things are tense, that there is an expectation of violence. We do have evidence that Twitter can be used to perhaps inflame, but also de-escalate tensions. And in the book, I argue very strongly that perhaps social media is giving voice to people and groups who were previously marginalized, which we would probably think is generally a positive thing, but there is also a, a perhaps negative to that and that it could inflame tensions and reinforce division, particularly when people watch 
antagonistic and often sectarian interactions between unionists and nationalists, loyalists and republicans, uh, on people on both sides of these issues, uh, that people may often get a very negative reinforcing view of the other community. That's very long-winded, but I'll stop there. Thanks, Emily. No, I think it's really important, actually, to kind of set out what you've done in the book so that people can kind of engage. Um, I just wondered, actually, if you'd also say a bit more about your, the approach you take in the book. So you've got the two case studies, hmm. um, but you kind of use a, a bit of content analysis of some mainstream media, as well as um, looking at hmm. um, different platforms um, online in a qualitative way. So I wondered you could sort of just explain a little bit about you know your decisions there and why that's really imp important yeah good question i mean i th i think as a qualitative researcher i mean my phd used to, i mean a, a content analysis but based on gibson and ward's um 2000 a website analysis one which which again is very useful but in this book i mean i certainly find the flexibility offered by thematic analysis for looking at comments more generally um, but also looking at comments which are quite short. And I think this is something as a qualitative researcher we often face. Um, there's a lot of qualitative work on social media. You know, again, it's very easily applied. But for me, it was an important aspect to capture the richness of that. And also, we'll talk about this later, I'm sure, you know, looking at cross-platform aspects too, where you know, some of the same content, some of the same themes do crop up on Facebook, Twitter and YouTube. The content analysis of newspapers, I think, again, that came from feedback on some articles I'd published while also doing the book. So thinking in particular about how we contextualize social media activity, very often in, in some of the hashtags I looked at, for example, journalists, as you'd imagine, are you know very influential very often, They're very often a source of information. And also looking at how the news media coverage was in eff effectively being circulating on Twitter, being shared, but also social media content was also being discussed in some of the media coverage. And I think for the flag protest study, it, it was quite helpful in thinking about what themes were people reading in their newspapers. And there only are three main newspapers in Northern Ireland. So, I mean, there was an, an easiness to this, perhaps there mightn't be for other projects, but even just looking at what actors were being cited. And also to what extent were some of the, the voices that I could see on Twitter, on Facebook, they were claiming the media were biased against them. They were claiming that the media weren't giving them a platform, I'm trying to find out evidence that that was true or not. And to a certain extent, I did find some evidence that they were not being uh, given a platform during the protest to articulate what they were about. At the same time, the media often framed some of these spokespeople as uh, some that are still very prominent, like Jimmy Bryson, for example, in ways which perhaps did reinforce some of the, the stereotyping and quite crude stereotyping we saw on social media. So for me as a researcher, I mean, I think um, qualitative work is very immersive. It can be very difficult. Um, I think some of the nuance would be missed if I had taken a quantitative approach towards this, to be honest. And, I think that the benefit, I suppose, is in terms of numbers, looking at the size of the data sets I gathered, they weren't huge and that helps. I mean, for some of the public Facebook pages um, and I was collecting in real time using tools like Discover Text and, and others too. Um, we weren't talking about millions. We're talking maybe about, you know, under 100,000 in some cases and very specific time periods. So I think it was a decision that was kind of born of that, but also born of that need to understand the complexity about some of these issues that were being discussed and i'll finish before i start rambling more but the idea of parody i mean i think that was something which is quite a, a recurring theme in the book social media accounts in 2012-13 that were purposely set out to deceive to suggest they were something they were not um, i think you wouldn't perhaps have picked up on that if it was quantitative because in some cases parody accounts were very closely modeled on the people they were trying to parody or put fun at yeah, no, I couldn't agree more with the need to do um, qualitative research on some of this stuff as someone who's kind of done that myself. As you say, some of those little nuances you just wouldn't be able to account for with any kind of meaningful content analysis. Yeah. So I think it's um, really interesting, actually, the way you approach it. Um, let's go back to the cross-platform thing again, because I think um, that's really useful. So in for those of you who haven't looked. So in, there are various chapters of the book. So one of which you look at the Facebook pages, mm 
of um, people organizing the flag protests. And then there's kind of Twitter, which is about reactions to that. And then you look at YouTube comments as well. Um, so I wondered if you would kind of say a bit more about that, but also um, it struck me that a lot of the, the way you kind of, I mean, this could have been an editorial decision as much as about your findings, mm. but you know, the, the different platforms were being used in kind of different ways. So on mm. the, the organization was happening on Facebook, but then, you know, the main, the mainstream response, let's say was coming from Twitter. Mm. And then obviously you, they were using YouTube to share footage of the protests and the kind of police's response to the protests to try and kind of get a sense of, to show that the police were responding badly to the protests kind of thing. So I wondered why you thought, you know, why, why do you think they're used in a different way? Is this just purely an affordance or demographic issue? Mm. Or is there something about the culture of these platforms that kind of meant they were used differently? I was really eloquently put, Ellen. Emily, I have to borrow that, like the way you did that. I mean, I think it's a bit of both. I mean, I think uh, one of the things we tend, I think, as social media researchers to gravitate towards the three sites I've looked at. So, I mean, I think I should probably acknowledge that, that there's a lot underneath the surface that we don't see. And, and I think in the conclusion, I mean, I'm sure we all have experience of this. Um, when you're trying to research something which can change so suddenly, I mean, my final chapter had... Uh, three different UK prime ministers noted in it, and it had to be updated quite regularly in 2019 due to what was happening. There is an element where you're also aware that people do not necessarily migrate from platform to platform, but I think it's fair to say that in, in the periods um, since the fly protests, um, a lot of the groups and individuals that um, I looked at who were using Facebook, and, and these are public Facebook pages, I mean, I think it's important to stress that we're talking about December 2012. So, I mean, we have had Occupy Arab Spring, you know, we have had some events which have perhaps gravitated certain groups towards using these sites because they offer that ability to organize protests and demonstrations. But the groups that um, certainly behind the fly protests, all unanimously after the event, even in 2013, uh, Jimmy Bryson speaking at an event I was at said you know, social media didn't help us at all. It was a hindrance. You know, already there, there was an understanding that it had opened them up to a lot of criticism, trolling, very negative behaviors. I, I any benefit in terms of the organizational capacity on Facebook was perhaps eroded by the fact that on these public Facebook pages, people were trolling those pages. There were people who were mocking the way people you know, spelt or misspelt certain words. And there was an element where it opened up things perhaps in a way which was unhelpful. So I think there is a platform affordance issue in terms of Facebook is still the most popular social media platform in Northern Ireland as it is in many places around the world. So it's perhaps not a surprise that people who were already on there would try and use public Facebook pages um, to organize the initial flag protests. At the same time, I think Twitter and this, I think the figure I used in the book, it was only about 18% of people in Northern Ireland, according to Ofcom, were using Twitter around this time, which is, I mean, a relatively small number, albeit that I think the way the media obviously use Twitter, you know, to an extent, it has effects and impacts beyond the, the small number of people who are Northern Ireland Twitter, if you want to call it that. I think Twitter, the news element of it, you know, like we have seen in other contexts like Gezi Park or Occupy, was a prominent finding for me. And I think you're right in terms of YouTube. I mean, I would caveat the, the YouTube comments thing by saying, if you go on any YouTube video, you're gonna get some comments that are perhaps not the most constructive. Um, I think what was perhaps surprising was that, again, the, the, the volume of comments, which were one side of the debate and taking an extreme position. You know, I, you have all, some things in there and I find this in other YouTube studies where people are almost commenting without viewing the video, you know, so it's not a case they're, they're watching the video and deciding for themselves. They almost have their view predetermined. And I think that's where having the media analysis can be quite helpful because very often people will react to things in ways which show they haven't engaged with the content at all. And I think with the YouTube um, stuff, I mean, what was striking to me is that there was a police report, I think in 2014, which reviewed YouTube videos similar to what, probably some of the same videos I looked at. And they had found no evidence of you know, police brutality, no evidence to support the idea that police had been heavy handed towards the protesters. And my research corroborated that claim. I mean, a lot of the videos that I saw, there was a 
very sensationalist caption, which would say police brutality, police use dogs. And when you watch the videos, um, that wasn't really substantiated. There were very often people on camera talking heads saying I was beaten up by the police, but no evidence of it. So whether that's a degree of maybe naivety around 2012, 13, about how these platforms can open up to that, perhaps. But I think also it was an element where, going back to the starting point, you have DUP communication officer who I interviewed in 2010. At the time, all the people I spoke to from the political parties went, Obama did it, so we'll try and borrow parts of it, which of course doesn't work. I mean, you can't borrow aspects of campaigns which are much more well-funded than that. But they were still perhaps um, experimenting with it. And I think the flag protests, you perhaps see evidence of that, that now, April 2021, with the, the, the violence that we saw in, in relation to the, the, the Northern Ireland Protocol and other in incidents, you perhaps have people more wary. And, and I do think people have perhaps moved some of those conversations to less public spaces as a result of this. And I think that's where WhatsApp and IM comes in. Um, I'm also keen to stress in the book that I'm looking at the visible parts. I mean, if, if the iceberg analogy is here, I'm looking at the bits you can see, you know, the bits that are still there. There's probably a lot below the surface that I, I didn't see as part of this that may well have, have corroborated some of the things that I found or may well have different aspects of it too. But it was certainly interesting to see how open it was at that time. And I don't think that will be the same now. Yeah, it makes you wonder actually kind of in terms of the audience or, you know, who is this for? Mm -hmm. So are some of these yeah. things performative in any way? You know, is it about kind of trying to establish? Well, I think, I mean, I think a thread that goes through from what mm. I'm picking up is that there's a whole need to establish legitimacy for whichever side yeah. of the kind of debate you're on. So those who are organizing flag protests need to explain how this is an attack on their culture or that's what they perceive it to be. Whereas those who are mm. critical of that um, need to kind of take issue with not only their means, but you know the way in um, the way in which they're kind of going about it. So um, mm. I wonder, you know, do you think that the kind of it being slightly public facing changes anything about it? I think that's a good point. I mean, I mean, I think the question you come back to again. This probably applies to social media research in lots of contexts, but perhaps specifically here, where throughout the troubles, throughout the conflict, um, you know, we have um, a large, you know, operation by, by the British to censor media coverage, you know, the, the media being involved perhaps um, in framing the conflict a certain way to, to frame Republican and loyalist paramilitaries as criminals. I mean, we have a lot of evidence of that. And at the same time, on the other side of the fence, you have uh, loyalist and Republican paramilitaries who develop their own press. And I suppose the question would be asked, you know, is social media perhaps uh, you know, an evolution of that? And I think to a certain extent, uh, perhaps, but I suppose the question is, if it's enabling people who do not have those affiliations or certainly don't prominently display them to articulate a response to something, you know, is that on balance a good thing? And of course, there is that issue about if you're making a claim, that doesn't mean to say someone observing it will believe it or accept it and i think what the the flag protest in ardoin showed very clearly was that you know there was certainly a platform here for lawyers to say we feel the peace process is not benefiting us we think the police have been politicized against us but that didn't mean to say they got more sympathy i mean i think quite clearly they didn't and quite clearly you're right in terms of legitimacy whether it's about policing where there's already a lot of contention about legitimacy of policing anyhow this is almost like another layer where citizens are articulating things, but not necessarily agreeing. And I suppose there is that issue about, you're not gonna reach a consensus on a YouTube comments thread about whether the police were right or wrong. I mean, that's probably unrealistic, but if the visibility of people saying the police are this or that um, is there where other people seeing it are perhaps exposed to an alternative view, but also might not actually change their view it's probably having positive and negative aspects, which is such a social sciences answer to say, good and bad, advantages and disadvantages. I mean, my argument would be that I think there is positivity in people having a voice that they perhaps felt they didn't have where it was an era of traditional media where there was limited opportunity for them to do that. But whether or not it changes things on the ground, I'm not so sure. And I think it can help and hinder. And I think that's one of the things that I was keen to stress in the book
Um, there are examples of very pro-social behavior and there are examples of anti-social behavior in much the same way, I think, as we see even last week with what we've seen around English footballers being abused on social media and being supported. There are common threads here. And I suppose social media does accelerate, yes, hate speech and negativity. And on the flip side, people do try to use it to counter that. Um, I think that's that's part of the DNA of social media. And I think it's, for me, interesting to see in 2012, 13, similar things which are present now, except we're all a bit more aware of it. I think we're all a bit more maybe suspicious of certain things. Maybe it's disinformation, misinformation, bots. We all kind of look at social media a little bit warily at times i think during these events and i think that's probably because we have nine ten years of experience of people maybe using it to inflame things in the case of northern ireland and also in other contexts too i think what really interested me was the kind of the stuff the almost i said this to you earlier in our pre-chat the, the almost ambient sectarianism mm, so it yeah. wasn't always overtly kind of calling people names or being overtly abusive, but there's a very kind of, again, it go, I guess it goes back to who, trying to undermine people's legitimacy in terms of what positions they're taking. Mm. And I think that's, you know, one of those things where you can have quite a robust discussion online and it doesn't, and it can be un, quite uncivil actually, but it doesn't mean that it's abusive. Mm. And, you know, th that's kind of happening also in these places where, you know, obviously feelings and stuff run very deep. So. Um, it, it was really interesting to see that kind of across the different platforms. Yeah. Um, sorry, go on. I was going to say, I mean, ambient sectarianism is a great way of framing it because you're right. I mean, that there's an element where people don't need to use the language that we would associate with sectarianism to not show sectarian attitudes or views. But at the same time, is there that kind of civility in how people interact? I mean, I think on... I think to be fair, if you're sampling how Twitter is being used during an event unfolding, it's fair to say most people are not going to react in a way which is measured and calm. You know, they're, they're reacting in the moment. And to a certain extent, that's reflected in the data I found where I, mean, I, I collected data around the Ardoin parade dispute, I think 24 hours before and, and 24 hours after the, the parade. So surprise, surprise, during the actual day of the 12th of July, there's a lot more people tweeting about it than there are before and after. And at the same time, the day before, there were people who were sharing quite positive images of our doing of that community, which were still being shared on the day of that, but they were being perhaps overshadowed by people speculating about whether the parade would be forced down a road, whether the police were going to intervene or not. Uh, and of course, other rumours too. So I think you're right. I mean, there is, maybe there, there's an ambient sectarianism or, or hate speech on all platforms during such events. I think that's something which is maybe a built-in feature of it. Yeah, I think you certainly see that around kind of ambient sexism as well with a lot, mm. lot, of, a lot of online um, media. Yeah. Um, given the kind of contentious nature of some of this stuff then, um, I wondered if you'd kind of elaborate a bit on the kind of ethics of how you got, went about doing, how you go about doing this stuff, because, um, you know, it's kind of, a, you know, a serious thing, isn't it, to kind of take this stuff seriously. And I know you're interested in online ethics, so I thought I'd uh, ask you about that. Thanks, Emily. Uh, I mean, I, I think ethics isn't a key area for me, I think, because um, I mean, going back to the PhD, looking at websites, now again, it was websites, so it was a different thing. But I mean, I remember at that time, um, there wasn't really any ethics scrutiny of this sort of work. You know, it was probably assumed that if it was out there, grab it. You know, if it was, I mean, again, these were organizational pages. So to a certain extent, that was possibly true, but there wasn't the actual process. And while I'm sure everyone in this room or who watches this will have very negative experiences of ethics reviews and committees and, and the bureaucracy of it. I mean, for me, it was quite interesting to see how my position kind of evolved in this. Um, particularly, I mean, specific to this, you have um, on Twitter, some of the responses to the flag protests were shaming and mocking and othering. So again, a key aspect of that for people who oppose the protests and very often crossed the line was this idea take a screenshot of what a lot of us said on that facebook page which is public and then share it on twitter to point fun at them to mock them so it wasn't just about highlighting their sectarianism it was about calling them stupid ill-educated bigoted as well 
And I think there, there was an element of that when I was coming to do the work, was, which was obviously considering, well, as a researcher, we should never automatically please participants. And clearly with social media research where you can't consent, every person who leaves a comment on, on a YouTube video or on a Facebook page or on a, or a Twitter hashtag, there is a complexity to that built in, but also thinking about, well, am I going to contribute towards what could be seen as shaming a group or groups who feel they're marginalized already? And as a research that does give you pause for thought and thinking about, do you need thinking about ethics very much as, as situated on the specifics of a project? Do you need to think about, well, am I as a researcher likely to make this somewhat worse? In addition to the issue about these are unaware participants who very few, if any, would have thought in 2012, 13, that the comments they were posting would be in a book in 2021, for example. So there is that tension. And I think my kind of approach towards it, um, I wrote an article with Filippo Trevisan a few years ago about this, which, which feeds into this book. Um, it might be strict, but, but my sort of view on it was, if our focus is on what they're saying rather than who they are, um, that probably means we don't have to directly quote every comment which is extreme or identify every user. I think there is a responsibility in us as researchers to think about not just our commitments to the institution we're in or to you know, the ethics committee specifically, but also to those people here in the research who we couldn't speak to about their involvement beforehand. And I think my kind of ethics stance, if you can call it that, was more about if it's a politician or somebody who has a public profile, for me, you can probably quote them and identify them without any, any issue because they wouldn't have an expectation of privacy. But if it's a citizen, a loyalist flag protester who is on a Facebook page, which they, again, maybe even at that time assumed was private when it wasn't, I think we have to think more about paraphrasing uh, and in the book, there's often, I'll make a reference to a flag protester said this to give them some protection. But, and a crucial but, and we all have had this, I'm sure, um, even applying anonymization as a strategy, there are limitations to it. And clearly in some of the work that I've done, people, if they had the motivation to go back, if those comments were still there, could probably identify them. And I think it's probably being aware that we can't ever fully anonymize this sort of data. And as a qualitative researcher, how you present it presents that kind of challenge. But I still maintain we are focusing on what was being said rather than who was saying it. And to a certain extent, my approach reflects that. Maybe conservative for some, and, I, and, it, and certainly in the readings I did about it, you might have some people who think you should expose you know, these sorts of attitudes and behaviors, but it's how you do it. And for me, I think you can convey things which are often quite ugly, quite vile, quite sectarian, misogynistic in ways that don't draw the crowd towards these people in ways which perhaps are not helpful. And I think there is a societal responsibility for us all when we do this sort of research too. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, having published stuff, um, tweets and stuff myself that have contained really quite vile sentiments, <laughs> you know, yeah, you can't, I feel like you can't, as you say, the focus is on what people are saying rather than, you know, who's saying it, which you obviously don't really necessarily know from yeah. a huge data set anyway. Um, the final thing I wanted to ask you about in um, was in relation to, I guess it's a similar thing in terms of ethics, really. It's about your kind of subject position. So mm -hmm. as someone researching this, um, and I mean, I guess you would probably have to have um, quite a, a, a knowledge of the communities and the situation in Northern Ireland to be able to do this justice. How do you feel, you know, how, how does that impact on the way you might go about studying this kind of thing? That's a good question. I mean, I, I think it's a tricky one because language is, is obviously inherently political, particularly in the context that I was working. So for example, uh, having Northern Ireland in the title to some people would be seen as a flag. I'm sure that's the case. Equally, um, using Derry stroke London Derry again, I mean, these are compromises that a lot of researchers probably have to make at some point. And I think to a degree, um, you're never going to satisfy every person who reads it, that it's a, a reflection of what they experienced. I mean, I'd probably argue as a qualitative researcher, you know, you want to obviously show the richness of what was there. I mean, I think to an extent, um, there is always going to be a subjectivity in a qualitative researcher's outputs, whatever way they do it. And, and again, there's good reason that's a positive. 
I think probably my proximity to it is, is probably slightly different because, I mean, a lot of uh, people researching the fly protests live in the communities uh, that they were studying. So for researchers at Queen's or Ulster University, for example, you know, it's a different um, experience for them than it was for me. And I'm obviously looking at this now that um, I was living in England at the time. Um, and to a certain extent, there's an eerie parallel between my experience of the flag protest in Ardoyne, which, which is mediated by Twitter and Facebook, and some of the participants in my research. So I can relate to what their experience was in that sense. I think probably the, the question is always going to be to what extent um, when you're doing this sort of work, you know, do you try and reflect on the issue or in the way in which these issues were mediated? And I think as, as media and college researchers, I mean, to a certain extent, you have the benefit that you are looking at platform affordances, you are looking at what people were saying, and to a degree, you know, you can represent that using their words. Um, there will be some people who will sit and say, I imagine any work on the fly protest should take a position on it. I mean, for me, the fact that there was a fractured response to it, that there were people who were very opposed to these protests and there were people who supported it, you know, that had to be reflected in the work because it was in the data that I was collecting as well. And I think from, a, from the perspective of you know, interviewing um, you know, members of political parties or their comms officers specifically, I mean, you're, it's, it's a strange experience when you're obviously um, asking questions which are, are pretty non-controversial, but of course the way in which they're reflected in the book might be seen by some. I mean, in, in this and in my first book, um, Sinn Féin are the most sophisticated users of digital media by far. I mean, I think that's corroborated by other research, like by Patty Hoey, for example. You know, but you're, you know, you're obviously trying to, to accurately reflect things, but you're also aware at the same time that subjectivity must be in there. And I think it's, it's something that we should probably embrace rather than try and hide away from. Because if we're researching areas or, or communities or issues that we have experience of, that's probably a good thing. You know, it's not a bad thing. And to a certain extent, yeah, the book probably reflects eight, nine years of me thinking about some of these issues, but also um, coming back to it in 2020 during the pandemic, finishing off. I mean, a certain amount of time it elapsed since then. And I think in the final chapter, when you're reflecting what's happened since, you do kind of find yourself again, not revising what you find, but thinking about what it means now. And I think that's one of the things with what happened in April, where there was a, a for me, a lot of commonality, a lot of similarities in terms of how platforms are being used, particularly around misinformation uh, or in hate speech, um, YouTube clips being used to rally opinion one way or the other. You know, that seems quite similar to me. I mean, it was quite eerily similar to what I was finding looking at 2012, 2013 data. So I think it's an issue. I think it's an issue that I like to write more about. And I think in the book, if I was doing it again, uh, not to downplay what I've done, obviously. My publisher would kill me if I did that. I mean, I think I would probably try and put a bit more in about that because I think it's something as qualitative researchers we should acknowledge and embrace as part of the, the messiness of this work. Lovely. Thank you, Paul. So we've been rattling on a bit now, so we should <laughs> probably bring in some other voices into this conversation. So I'm going to stop um, sharing my screen if I can remember how to do it. <laughs> oh, no. Oh God, there we go. I stopped teaching two months ago and I've forgotten how to do it all already. Already. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're a little select group. So um, yeah, I'd like to invite anyone, if you've got any questions, oh, there's a question in the chat actually from James. So do you wanna come in and ask your question in real life, James? There he yeah, is. sure. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Emily and, and, and cheers, Paul as well for a really interesting conversation and I was I was fascinated you, you mentioned memes at the start and like effective uh, effective publics and the use of emotion and it made me you know just as, as someone that's also been kind of interested in how memes mm. are used within kind of activist groups how the activists were, were using memes was it kind of just like trivial silly humor that didn't necessarily have like a clear purpose in terms of their overall activism or was it connected to to um, you know different forms of engagement you know had, had those kind of clear connections but uh, yeah thank you both for the the conversation thanks james um i think a bit of both i mean this is going to show when this this research was conducted uh dimitri finds out 
if you remember that meme, that was sort of, again, there was a flag protest version of that, which um, I would say as more innocuous than in any way offensive. So again, there, there were some elements where people took memes which were being used in different contexts and adapted them, perhaps in ways which weren't biting or particularly uh, seen as uh, ins insensitive towards some of the flag protesters. You also have other things at wordplay, which I, I would see as more benign. Um, I mean, again, the flags hashtag, um, you have um, under that uh, people doing snow puns. So snow surrender, you know, again, I'm glad this has been recorded for that one as well. But you have people here doing things which are quite innocent. Um, people putting orange sashes on snowmen and saying, look, there's a flag protester in my garden. I would say that some of that was fairly benign. At the same time, you have that sort of element where memes are used to mock some of the flag protest um, spokespeople. So Jimmy Bryson, who some of you may probably know now where you might not have known before. If there's any news item about the Northern Ireland Protocol and loyalist communities, he's probably the go-to person who speaks on that. And he's here, again, there are people mocking his speech impediment, uh, making a lot of homophobic remarks, using images of him and, and obviously uh, remixing them to have very personal attacks on him. So there's almost like a spectrum where I think there is quite benign, almost quite irreverent, silly citizenship, I call it. And there are things which are more pointed and personal. And I think that probably again reflects the time in which the research was conducted, where I think Twitter at that time, um, people were starting to employ this as a form of, of silly citizenship, as Hartley calls it. And people were starting to think about how they could link um, perhaps things that they saw in one context to another. And I think from my perspective, um, the issue was perhaps some of the flag protesters seeing any of that activity would think it was dehumanizing them, that it was othering them. So there was perhaps a self-defensive measure in response to that, where it was certainly not taken if it was meant as irreverent or funny or humorous. It was taken as something more sinister, whilst also being alongside memes and wordplay and things which were quite um, vitriolic and how they frame some of the, the individuals involved. So it's a bit of both. And I think Twitter specifically was where I find a lot of that stuff, looking at how Northern Ireland Twitter was responding to this. There was an element where they went for that kind of response, uh, whereas loyalists were very much about organizing and um, protests on Facebook and sharing information about what was happening, not maybe about using that kind of um, silliness in what they did. Great, thank you. I see that Billa's got her hand up. She wants to come in. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Paul and Emily. It was a really interesting conversation. And I'm, I'm really sorry, actually, that I haven't read the book yet because it's my research area as well. And it's very interesting. And I'm, I'm very much looking forward um, to read it, Paul. Um, I, I just ca I can see, actually, quite a lot of similarities when you talk about this protest and the, okay. the Arab uprising, because um, um, during the Arab uprisings, the uprisings are mostly called as Facebook revolution, Twitter revolutions mm. as well. But later on, what we had seen is quite a negative messages towards the re revolution on these social media channels. Um, uh, and what was interesting is the catalyzers of these negative messages are often governmental actors. Mm. And I wonder if you had the chance to, to look at the actors who have been publishing negative messages, are they mostly uh, media channels or do we see governmental actors as well? Um, I have another question as well, sorry. Um, what do you think about it? Do you see any type of leadership, first of all, on these social media channels? Are there uh, actors who have been dominating these conversations or had a more influential role uh, than the others? I think you mentioned media actors, but mm. um, are there other types of do you think maybe, you know, public, mem public members who have been dominating these conversations? Um, and finally, uh, what I wanted to ask is, for scholars like me, um, it might be quite difficult to decide if this research, this study needs to be a, a book or academic article. So mm -hmm. how did you decide to write a book on this case rather than publish maybe several articles? Thank you. Oh, great. Good, a lot in there. Thanks, no, I really appreciate it. I mean, on the on the sort of uh, what accounts were influential in terms of you know, misinformation, disinformation, hate speech. 
Um, I mean, it'll not be a surprise that um, the UK government don't feature in this at all. So that's probably consistent with what they're doing right now. If you saw the news earlier on about amnesties and stuff like that. So there isn't really any sense that governmental actors are engaging in this. Um, and, and even at the, the devolved level, there's no evidence perhaps of the Northern Ireland Assembly. There are politicians. And if you've um, seen some of the DUP politicians and how they've responded to Brexit, it'll probably be no surprise to you that they would use social media to antagonize and to inflame tensions around the flag protests. And also the Ardoin parade dispute where you did have politicians uh, using Twitter during that. Again, in a good and a bad way. I mean, I think it's fair to say that um, on the Ardoin parade dispute issue, the, the two years I looked at, when there was no trouble, politicians on both sides, unionists and nationalists um, in the area would praise the good behaviour of their communities, would say it was a good thing. So there was an element where they were certainly, Emily and I were talking about this earlier on, they were performing in a way. They were obviously keen to say uh, good things when they could. Equally, when something happened, they'd point the finger at the other side. And, and certainly on the 12th of July, um, perhaps less so this year than other years. Um, there would always be in North Belfast and Ardoin, near the interfaces there, there would be some um, trouble in the area, particularly around bonfires. And again, I'm sure you might have seen some of the media footage of that. What was interesting was that I found some evidence of, of sort of or orchestrated bots activity. Um, now, I didn't expect to find this at all. I mean, this is uh, 2013 data, but it was uh, Twitter um, and there were essentially I think it was 12 or 15 tweets with seven or eight different accounts, exactly the same text. Um, a few of the accounts when even doing a crude search on Botometer had very high similarity to other ones too. And I use an example in the book. And again, this, there's this phenomenon called Shinner bots in Northern Ireland or, and also in, in the South as well, where um, Sinn Féin will have organized volunteers who will go on Twitter. Again, they ha will have shadow accounts and they will tweet similar messages a lot. And it was quite interesting to see that it was pretty easy to spot, to be honest. And it was a, it was a tweet about um, an incident in which a man had not been able to visit his sick wife in a hospital. So it was condemning the protesters, but it didn't seem to get much traction. There wasn't much evidence of engagement with it. And that does feed into since 2012, 13, um, Shinnerbot, if you look the term up, you'll see an awful lot of people talking about it. And to this day, um, whether it's any political debates um, in Ireland, North or South, you will see people go out, that's a Shinnerbot account in response to what looks like a, a citizen account, but as someone who has been mobilized to perhaps muddy the waters around contentious issues. So, I mean, I think that's something which um, is perhaps not a surprise because Sinn Féin would be seen as being more savvy when it comes to using this sort of tech. And I think that stands true today as it did back then. Um, on the on the issue about um, why a book, I mean, that's, a, that's a good question too. I mean, I think at the time when, um, it's like trying to hit a moving target. When I, when I finished the PhD, um, I'm not sell when, but you can probably find it online, show how old I am. But I mean, I wrote, got a book out of the first, my PhD. And at the time when I was publishing the book in 2010, 2011, social media was obviously at that point becoming a more significant uh, trend and more uh, more relevant to what I was doing. And the end of the, the first book, my sort of ending point was social media may well change what I found in this book. So it kind of felt to me like a, yeah, a difficult second album would be a good way of putting it. I have published a few articles around it. I mean, I, I think on ethics, for example, with Filippo Trevisan, it was quite a helpful exercise for me while writing the book to almost have like a dialogue with another researcher about it. And, and that sort of, again, fed into what I did. Um, but I think you can do both. I think it's probably a question about, you don't want to repeat yourself. You also don't want to, to basically reproduce a book which has been entirely published before. That would be daft. Um, I think a book gives you the space to think more about what it means. And I think that's something which with this, with the time frame as well, that was very beneficial to me. There were things that, at the end of the book project that were happening that also helped me contextualize what I had seen in the data before. And I think that can be a very helpful thing. And we need more books and long form writing in this kind of work. I think the, the academic model is article, 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 because that's seen as impactful. I think books have their place. And I think it would be a sad situation if we didn't have books which explored these sorts of issues in that kind of detail in 70, 80,000 words.
I think you had a third question, but I've forgotten it. So please do remind me if I didn't answer it. But uh, yeah, thank you for the, the questions. Really helpful. Yeah, thank you. And I think it is nice and not get, to get a good question about why a book, because, you know, it's something that we're mm. probably all thinking about in, you know, as you say, in recent times with the move towards articles. OK, I'm seeing that Dominic Ring has his hand up, too, if you want to come in. Hello, you're all right. Hey, Dominic. You hear what you just said about the book uh, thing and, and actually it preempts my question. With a society like Northern Ireland, where there is such a complex range of political forces, and you talk very much, obviously, about the traditional understandable divide between nationalism and unionism, but within those, um, you know, families, or as uh, the fragmentation has been very profound, as you see in the legislative, um, with um, the five main parties, if you will, and then there's there's uh, the tra the TUV's got representation inside the chamber and then there's Republican Sinn Féin which has never been particularly yeah. um, electorally successful but nonetheless precisely because of the, the nature of online communities these small groups but nonetheless very vocal and very well you know in their own sense well organized online can mm. disproportionately impact on uh, online interactivity and and of course in in a, in a conflict like Northern Ireland it's quite significant because they can raise the stakes I mean you know and 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 you know, it, 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 you know, there's a, it's a profoundly complex situation when you've got intra kind of, you know, yeah. community disputes as well going on, as well as the traditional kind of rivalry. Um, so I just wondered how you, you know, if you've got anything to say about that, whether you dealt with that aspect, the intra rather than the inter, as it were. And then the other thing, has, a question that arises, you, you kind of touched on it, but you as a researcher in what is a very, you know, can be sectarian uh, arena, Mm -hmm. uh, how how you reflect on that and 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 you know what what kind of what would you reflect you know what would you take takeaways about that? Thanks, Dominic. I mean, yeah, I mean it's important to to stress that what social media reveals, I think, is that um, communities are very rarely monolithic. Yet they're presented often in media coverage as if they are. I mean, the example I would give would be the DUP. Um, influence on the Theresa May government here it was almost presented as if Northern Ireland had all voted for the DUP. And as, as people back in Northern Ireland said at the time, in terms of the, the Brexit referendum, 56% voted to remain, yet the DUP position was being heard because they had that influence. And I think we often miss that fact that we present these things like the flag protesters, slightly different, I suppose, because there were unionists who were more critical but at the start, they weren't. And I think there was an element where, and I touch it in the book, one of the, the key um, ingredients in the first protest was a leaflet distributed, which was anti the Alliance Party, which drew people to Belfast City Hall about that, which the DUP and also Unionist Party, so mainstream Unionist parties were linked to. They denied it. But I mean, 40,000 leaflets put out in East Belfast the night before a vote or a couple of days before that. I mean, there was an element where they had almost let the gene out of the bottle in terms of this. And then other people emerged who became quite vocal advocates for that movement, like Jimmy Bryson, for example, or, or Willie Fraser. Um, so there is an element of that. And I think probably with some of the hashtags, you, you do have dissenting voices. I mean, one of the things that it's important to stress is even on the fly protest Facebook pages, you had people who supported the issue but did not support the methods, who did say you shouldn't be blocking roads, you, know, you shouldn't be doing this and there were alternative ways. Now, they were being drowned out by louder voices who were more inflammatory, and there is still an element where, at that time, it was a lightning rod for various issues about the peace process. And I think it's fair to say um, people who were urging caution were ignored during that period. So I do think it, it exposes intra as well as inter community differences. I do think with some of the hashtags I used, there was perhaps more of a consensus view against or in favor of things by virtue of, of like the flags hashtag, for example. Uh, there were people within that who were trying to almost piggyback on other issues, um, particularly around business and about supporting Belfast city center traders. So there's an element of that and social media can help us perhaps hone in on that. Albeit that I do suspect we miss so much with what we can't see on less public platforms. I mean, in terms of, I mean, the other issue, I mean, it's one of those things I constantly reflect on. I think as a researcher, the language you use can be viewed as polarizing. 
you can often get a very negative response when you do things in the public domain. And of course that includes social media. And I think with, with the flag protests, certainly you see evidence of that where academic researchers, whether or not they're from Northern Ireland or those communities or not, are often the firing line and often the subject of, as we see with post-Brexit Britain, you know, they're almost dismissed as radical Marxists if they have a certain viewpoint. And there's an effort to delegitimize their analysis, often based on a perceived political affiliation, which someone thinks they have. So it is a difficult environment to work in. I say that in the East Midlands, very near you, Dominic. You know, I, I have a degree of distance, but I imagine it would be different if I was working and living there, doing some of this research, perhaps. And that might well be a good and a bad thing as far as my relationality to it, too. Congratulations, anyway. Well Thanks, done. Dominic. Cheers. Yes, thank you. Um, do we have any other questions? I don't think I see any other hands up, but feel free to come in if you do have any questions or comments for Paul. Okay. Um, yeah, if I'll just say quickly, I was just mentioned this to you earlier, but I was thinking it was interesting in relation to the Westminster government announcing that the Union flag will be flown on all government buildings <laughs> or whenever they made that announcement in March. Now, you know, I wonder if they'll be claiming that as a, uh, a win for the old flag protests eight <laughs> years down the line. <laughs> Quite possibly, yes. <laughs> okay, then, if there are no further questions, I suppose all that's left is for me to thank Paul very much for having a chat with me about his excellent book, which I highly recommend. And um, thank you all for your questions and participation. So we're gonna be taking a break now from our online sessions until September, because obviously it's you know summer holiday time, hopefully. Um, so if you're on the mailing list or follow our Twitter account, then we'll be announcing September's session, hopefully not too um, long away. So thank you all for coming. And uh, I will see you online somewhere soon, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank you.